Robert Emmett was still a very young man when he led an armed insurrection against Dublin Castle, the stronghold of English rule in Ireland, and as a result was arrested on the 23rd of July and brought to trial on September the 19th of the same year, 1803. And these are the words he addressed from the dock to Lord Norbury, who, having sentenced him to be hanged, drawn and quartered, and his head struck from his body, then asked him, Prisoner at the bar, what have you therefore now to say why judgment of death and execution should not be awarded against you according to law? My lords, I am asked what I have to say why sentence of death should not be pronounced on me according to law. I have nothing to say that can alter your predetermination, nor that it will become me to say with any view to the mitigation of that sentence which you are to pronounce and I must abide by. But I have that to say why my reputation should be rescued from the load of false accusation and calumny which has been cast upon it. I do not imagine that your lordships will give credit to what I am going to utter. I have no hope that I can anchor my character in the breast of this court. I can only wish... And this is the utmost that I expect, that your lordships may suffer it to float down your memories until it finds some more hospitable harbour to shelter it from the storms by which it is now buffeted. Were I only to suffer death after being adjudged guilty by your tribunal, I should bow in silence and meet the fate that awaits me without a murmur, but the sentence of the law which delivers my body to the executioner will, through the ministry of the law, labor in its own vindication to consign my character to obloquy, for there must be guilt somewhere. Whether in the sentence of the court or in the catastrophe, time must determine. The man dies, but his memory lives. That my memory may not perish, that it may live in the respect of my countrymen, I seize upon this opportunity to vindicate myself from some of the charges alleged against me. When my spirit shall be wafted to a more friendly port, when my shade shall have joined the bands of those martyred heroes who have shed their blood on the scaffold and in the field, in the defense of their country and of freedom, this is my hope. I wish that my memory and my name may animate those who survive me, while I look down with complacency on the destruction of that perfidious government which upholds its domination in Ireland by blasphemy of the Most High, which displays its power over men as over the beasts of the forest, which sets man upon his brother and lifts his hand in the name of God against the throat of his fellow who believes or who doubts a little more or a little less than the government standard, a government which is steeled to barbarity by the cries of the orphans and the tears of the widows it has made. I appeal to the immaculate God. I swear by the throne of heaven before which I must shortly appear, by the blood of the murdered patriots who have gone before me, I swear that my conduct has been through all this peril and through all my purposes governed only by the conviction which I have uttered and by no other view than that of the emancipation of my country from the superhuman oppression under which she has too long and too patiently travailed. And I confidently hope that, wild and chimerical as it may appear, there is still union and strength in Ireland to accomplish this noblest of enterprises. Of this I speak with the confidence of intimate knowledge and with the consolation that appertains to that confidence. What I have spoken is not intended for your lordship. My expressions are for my countrymen. If there is a true Irishman present, let my last words cheer him in the hour of his affliction. Mr. Emmett. I am not on this bench to listen to an avowal of abominable treason or to attempt to vindicate criminal measures and principles through the dangerous medium of eloquent but perverted talents. 
what you have said, sir, but confirms and justifies the verdict of the jury. My lords, it may be a part of the system of angry justice to bow a man's mind by humiliation to the purposed ignominy of the scaffold, but worse to me than the purposed shame or the scaffold's terrors would be the shame of such foul and unfounded imputations as have been laid against me in this court. You, my lord, are a judge. I am the supposed culprit. I am a man. You are a man also. By a revolution of power, we might change places, though we could never change characters. If I stand at the bar of this court and dare not vindicate my character, what a farce is your justice. If I stand at this bar and dare not vindicate my character, how dare you calumniate it? Does the sentence of death which your unhallowed policy inflicts on my body condemn my tongue to silence and my reputation to reproach? Your executioner may abridge the period of my existence, but while I exist, I shall not forbear to vindicate my character and motives from your aspersions. And as a man to whom fame is dearer than life, I will make the last use of that life in doing justice to that reputation which is to live after me and which is the only legacy I can leave to those I honor and love, and for whom I am very proud to perish. As men, my lords, we must appear on the great day at one common tribunal, and it will then remain for the searcher of all hearts to show a collective universe who was engaged in the most virtuous actions or swayed by the purest motives? My country's oppressors Mr. or... Mr. Emmett, you are making an avowal of dreadful treasons and of a determined purpose to have persevered in them, which I do believe has astonished your audience. You surely have learning and discrimination enough to know that if a judge were to sit in a court of justice to hear any man proclaim treason and to proceed to unwarrantable lengths in order to captivate or delude the unwary, it would be an insult to the established forces of the government of this country. Listen then to the sentence of the law. My lords! Will a dying man be denied the legal privilege of exculpating himself in the eyes of the community from a reproach thrown upon him during his trial by charging him with ambition and attempting to cast away for a paltry consideration the liberties of his country? Why did your lordships insult me? Or rather, why insult justice in demanding of me why sentence of death should not be pronounced against me? I know, my lords, I know. I know that form prescribes that you should ask this question. The form, however, also presents the right of answering. This, no doubt, may be dispensed with, and so indeed might the whole ceremony of the trial, since the death sentence was already pronounced at Dublin Castle before the jury were impaneled. Your lordships are but the priests of the oracle, and I insist on the whole of the forms. You may proceed, sir. I am charged with being an emissary of France. An emissary of France. And for what end? It is alleged that I wish to sell the independence of my country. And for what end? Was this the object of my ambition? No. I am no emissary. And my ambition was to hold a place among the deliverers of my country, not in power nor in profit, but in the glory of the achievement. Sell my country's independence to France. And for what end? No, but for ambition. Oh, my country. Was it personal ambition that could influence me? Had ambition been the soul of my actions, could I not by my education and fortune, by the rank and consideration of my family, have placed myself among the proudest of your oppressors? My country was my idol. To it I sacrificed every selfish, every endearing sentiment, and for it I now offer up myself. Oh, God. No, my Lord. I acted as an Irishman, determined on delivering my country from the yoke of a foreign and unrelenting tyranny and the more galling yoke of a domestic faction, which is its joint partner and perpetrator in the patricide. 
It was the wish of my heart to extricate my country from this doubly riveted despotism. I wished to place her independence beyond the reach of any power on earth. I wished to exalt her to that proud station in the world. Connection with France was indeed intended, but only as far as mutual interest would sanction or require. Were the French to assume any authority inconsistent with the purest independence, it would be the signal for their destruction. We sought their aid, and we sought it as we had assurance we should obtain it, as auxiliaries in war and as allies in peace, were the French to come as invaders or as enemies, uninvited by the wishes of the Irish people, I should oppose them to the utmost of my strength. Yes, my countrymen, I should advise you to meet them upon the beach with a sword in one hand and a torch in the other. I would meet them with all the destructive fury of war. I would animate my countrymen to immolate them in their boats before they had contaminated the soil of my country. And if they succeeded in lending and if forced to retire before superior discipline, I would dispute every inch of ground, burn every blade of grass, and the last entrenchment of liberty should be my grave. What I could not do myself if I should fall, I should leave as a last charge to my countrymen to accomplish, because I should feel conscious that life, any more than death, is unprofitable when a foreign nation holds my country in subjection. I wish to procure for Ireland the guarantee which Washington procured for America, to procure an aid which by its example would be as important as its valor, disciplined, gallant, pregnant with science and with experience, that of a people who would perceive the good and polish the rough points of our character. They would come to us as strangers, and they would leave us as friends after sharing in our perils and elevating our destiny. And these were my objects, not to receive new taskmasters, but to expel old tyrants. It was for these ends I sought aid from France, because France, even as an enemy, could not be more implacable than the enemy already in the bosom of my country. I have been charged with that importance in the emancipation of my country as to be considered the keystone of this combination of Irishmen, or as your lordship expressed it, the life and blood of the conspiracy. Oh, you do me honor over much. You have given to a subaltern all the credit of a superior. There are men engaged in this conspiracy who are not only superior to me, but even to your own conception of yourself, my lord. Men before the splendor of whose genius and virtue I should bow with respectful deference. Men who would think themselves disgraced by shaking your blood-stained hand. What, my lord, will you tell me on the passage to the scaffold which that tyranny of which you are but the intermediary executioner has erected for my murder, that I am accountable for all the blood that has been and will be shed in this struggle of the oppressed against the oppressor? Shall you tell me this, and must I be so very a slave as not to repel it? I do not fear to approach the omnipotent judge to answer for the conduct of my whole life. And am I to stand here appalled by this mere remnant of mortality? By you, too, although if it were possible to collect all the innocent blood that you have shed in your unhallowed ministry in one great reservoir, your lordship might swim in it. No, sir. My lords, you are impatient for the sacrifice. The blood which you seek is not congealed by the artificial terrors which surround your victim. It circulates warm and unruffled through the channels which God created for noble purposes, but which you are now bent to destroy for purposes so grievous that they cry to heaven. Be yet patient. I have but a few more words to say. I am going to my cold and silent grave. My lamp of life is nearly extinguished. My race is run. 
The grave opens to receive me, and I sink into its bosom. I have but one request to ask at my departure from this world. It is the charity of its silence. Let no man write my epitaph, for as no man who knows my motives dares nor vindicate them, let not prejudice or ignorance asperse them. Let them and me rest in obscurity and peace. Let my tomb remain uninscribed and my memory in oblivion until other times and other men can do justice to my character. When my country takes her place among the nations of the earth, then, and not till then, let my epitaph be written. I have done.